السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهداه وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His household, his companions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all and to bless every single one of us and to grant us all goodness in this world and the next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us entry into heaven, into Jannah without reckoning in a way that through his mercy we are so pleased that we will be able to smile all the way. Amen. My mothers and sisters, it is indeed a very important topic. When the Prophet ﷺ discussed important topics, he discussed them in such a simple manner that they were understood so easily by those who were around. Remember, at that time, people were highly intelligent. They were highly educated, but they were unlettered. There's a difference between the two. Unlettered meaning unable to read and write, the majority of them, but they were highly educated. They were very wise. They knew a lot. And they progressed as life passed because of their following of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was the following of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there is a very famous hadith that is known as Hadith Jibreel. If we hear the term Jibreel, Hadith Jibreel, we should know that it refers to one thing. It refers to an incident where the Prophet, peace be upon him, was seated with some of his companions and there came a man. And this man walked in to this majlis, majlis meaning like a little sitting and gathering of some of the companions. And as he came in, subhanallah, he looked in a certain way. And this was described by the companions, radiallahu anhum. They say, we saw a man, he was very good looking. He was in white clothing, completely white in terms of clothing. And his hair, totally black, subhanallah, completely black. So white clothing, black hair. And none of us knew him from amongst us, which means he came from afar. He came from somewhere far away. Nobody knew him from amongst us. But at the same time, there was no sign that he had undertaken a journey. Obviously, what this would mean is if it's a person nobody knows, they are from far. And if they are from afar, there would be a little sign to say, you know what, this person has red eyes. Perhaps they have, you know, bags as we call them under their eyes. Perhaps they're looking a little bit tired and so on. Normal, because you made a long journey. But this man, no sign whatsoever. So he comes in and everyone's watching, looking. He greets, he sits down in a way that we sit towards the end of salah, known as a tashahud, right? When we sit, he sat in the same way. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was sitting in a similar way. So, I think this is disturbing me, my brothers. The, the, the feedback here is a little bit too much. Uh, so what happened is, subhanallah, he sat in a way that his knees were touching the knees of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That is very, very close, subhanallah. That is extremely close. And he says, he started asking questions. Oh Muhammad, what is Islam? Now everyone's watching, hey, this person, the way he's asking. For, for you and me, it would seem rude. But obviously the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were listening, watching, because they knew that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa himself was there. Let's wait and watch how the reaction is. Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa what is Islam? He says, Islam, and he explains the five pillars in brief. He says, to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And that I am the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to fulfill your salah and to, to give your zakah and to fulfill your fast in Ramadan and to go for hajj if you are able and capable. Man ilayhi sabilan. Whoever can go and whoever has the means. So he says, sadaqta, which means you have spoken the truth. So the sahaba radiallahu anhum are looking at this man and they are thinking to themselves, they are surprised. He's asking and he's saying, yeah, you're right. You know, imagine a little boy coming into your classroom and he asks the question, ma'am, what's the sum? You know, I don't know, for example, this divided by this. And then you say, well, the answer is this. He says, yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, 
That's exactly what happened to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the man asked another question, follow-up question, before anyone could say anything. There was another question. What's the question? What is iman? What is iman? Now, you and I, if we don't have that knowledge, we wouldn't even know that there is a difference between Islam and iman, a Muslim and a mu'min. There is a difference between the two. You wouldn't know if you had not learned. So he asks, what is iman? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum are surprised. This man is asking in this way. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa responded. And what did he say? He said that iman is, and he mentions the six pillars, tu'mina billah, to believe in Allah. Wa malaikatihi and the angels, wa kutubihi and the books that were revealed to the messengers, wa rusulihi and all the messengers that had come down. You need to believe in all of them. Wal yawmil akhir and the last day. To believe in the last day, wal qadar and to believe in fate that good and bad is from Allah. Hulwihi wa murri min Allah. You know khairihi wa sharri min Allah. The sweet and the sour of destiny or of fate is from Allah. The good and the bad of fate is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to believe, you need to surrender. So these are six pillars. And right at the end, one of the pillars is reiterated. Reiterated. So it sounds like seven pillars, but it's actually six. Let's take a look at it. We say, Aman to Billah. Don't we say, Aman to Billah? I believe in Allah. I believe in Allah. Wa malaikatihi. And the angels. That's the second one. One is Allah, then the angels. وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْقَدَرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And there is one that some people add, they say, وَالْبَعْثِ Al-ba'th meaning the resurrection. The resurrection and belief in the last day, they are added and put into one because they are all connected to post-death. Do we follow? They are all connected to post-death. So this is why the majority will tell you there are six pillars of Islam. Once in a while you may get someone who will say there are seven. They are still referring to the same six. They are still referring to the same six. The only thing they've done is they've separated belief in the last day and belief in resurrection as two different things. Yet they are both connected to the belief in the life after death. It's connected to life after death. This is something amazing. So he says, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. Again, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum say, Ajibna lahu, yas'aluhu wa yusaddiquhu. We were surprised with this man. He's asking and he's confirming after that. It seems like he knew something. Then he says, tell us, what is ihsan? What is ihsan? Now the Sahaba radiallahu anhum are listening. Some of them may have known, some of them may not have known. They may be in the learning process. And some of them, it was refreshing for them, obviously, to hear this again. So he says, the Prophet Sallallahu says, Al-Ihsanu an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. Fa'il lam takun tarahu fa'innahu yarak. Ihsan is a level where you worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. It's a very high level of worship. And if you cannot do that, then at least you worship Allah as though or knowing that He is watching over you. So for example, when I'm fulfilling my salah, I say Allahu Akbar, and I should be feeling, and this is the highest level, that I, I'm seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One might say, well, we don't have a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala besides the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, where she says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nurun anna yarah. He was nur. So we don't have the precise description. But we do know that that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have a very powerful feeling within me that, you know what, I'm, this is for Allah. I feel like I'm a small speck among the huge and numerous creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am putting my head on the ground for Allah. So just picture yourself a little small person in the presence of the huge and numerous creation of Allah prostrating for Allah alone. And if you can't do that, because not everyone is able to do that, then at least you need to know Allah is watching me. That's a beautiful level. I'm sure we can do that. When we say Allahu Akbar, oh Allah is watching me. So I'm beautifying my prayer. I'm beautifying the way I go to ruku because I'm showing off to who? To Allah. That's the only show off in worship that is permissible to Allah. 
We are not allowed to show off. It's called riya. Riya meaning to, you know, to display, to show off to mankind, to human beings and so on. We are not allowed to show off at all except to Allah when it comes to acts of worship. Remember this. Whenever you're worshiping Allah, when you put on your scarf, make sure. And this is a tough one. Make sure that it is not for the rest of everyone else. And I'm doing it because what will this sister say? And what will the other brother say? And what will so and so? No, I'm doing it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, I might do it in a, in a good way. You know, you don't have to just throw a rag onto your head just as it is. No, you can do it in a good way on condition. If you would like a true reward for it, you need to do it in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To show off to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, it's tough for me. It's so hard for me. It's very difficult. So many people might look down upon me for as long as you don't. I don't mind. I'm doing it for you. That's what it is. Oh Allah, what I want to do here is for you alone. I'm showing you that I'm worshipping you. When I die, I would like you to take me into your mercy. These are the gems of belief in the hereafter. Why? Because I'm doing something now, firmly believing that I'm showing it off to Allah because He's my maker in the first place and He is the same supreme being that I'm going to return to at the end. So I want to show Him, you've sent me here on a mission. What is the mission? To find you, to worship you alone and to do deeds that will please you and abstain from that which you have prohibited. And wherever, wherever I have faulted, I seek your forgiveness. That is part of His plan. He told you that in the instructions, right? When you read the instructions, one, two, three, four, one of them you find, seek forgiveness wherever you have faulted, and I will forgive you. Amazing. That is hope in the hereafter. Imagine if Allah says, right, you commit a sin, you're not forgiven. It's over. Even if you ask for it. With us, someone apologizes to us, we say, I don't want, I'm not interested. Apologize, I don't want. Accept the apology, it's okay. If you can, accept it. Allah says it to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and the lesson is for all of us in Surah An-Nur when his daughter radiallahu anha Aisha as-Siddiq bint as-Siddiq radiallahu anhuma when she was accused of fornication or adultery when she was accused of the crime itself by people who were just hypocrites rumor mongers and some of the people spread the rumor one of those was a man known as Mistah ibn Athatha radiallahu anhu he fell he fell into the spreading of tale and rumor here comes Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu saying, this man is a relative of mine, he's a poor man, I've been spending money on him, and in return, he's spreading rumor about my own daughter. Minimum is, wallahi, I will never spend on him again. Which means, I'm not going to forgive this man. So Allah revealed verses. وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُولُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ سورة النور Allah says it is not befitting for those with virtue and honor, those whom Allah has bestowed wealth upon and goodness upon, that they say that they will not spend upon those who have made hijrah, the poor, the relatives. Let them forgive. Let them embrace and forgive. For indeed, Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Do you not want Allah to forgive you? Well then, forgive this young man, and you will find Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. The lesson I learn from this is when people apologize to me, if I would like the mercy of Allah, I need to accept the apology. I need to accept the apology. When we've demanded an apology, perhaps we may receive it with insincerity. Remember this. When you demand an apology, you may get it very insincere. When it comes without a demand, it is more sincere. Remember this. When we seek the forgiveness of Allah, it is genuine, it is sincere. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are genuine, sincere, you really regret. There is remorse. You admit, I will forgive you. And you know what will happen as a result? When you get to the hereafter, and we're talking about the gems of belief in the hereafter, I promise you that there will be no mention of that sin of yours at all. Even those who recorded it will be made to forgive it. If you did good deeds after having sought forgiveness, no matter what it was, that's Allah's plan. So this is the goodness. Allah keeps us going. He knows we have been created as human beings and He is the one who made us. But at the same time, He says, when you lead your lives, 
try and worship me in a way that you know I am watching. That's the lower level of Ihsan. Ihsan is two levels. The lower level is, you know that I'm watching. So what would happen? Would you falter? The reality is no, you wouldn't falter. And if you did, because shaitan keeps trying. Shaitan keeps trying. If you did falter, you know Allah is watching and Allah is merciful. He will forgive me for as long as I seek the forgiveness. And through his will and through his assistance, I will not commit the sin again. And if you happen to falter thereafter, a year later, a month later, two years later, five years later, you fall back into the same sin. Don't lose hope. Go back into the same seeking of forgiveness. You are still alive, aren't you? You know, as they say, the match is not yet over. You can still score a goal. So go and score it. If you are to, for example, witness a match, you might notice one team scores earlier on. It doesn't mean they won the match. You have to wait and see the score at the end. The same applies to our lives. Shaitan might have scored 10 goals and then you score one. It doesn't mean you have lost or Shaitan has won. At the end, you might score 10, 20 goals at once. And what was the score? 11 to Shaitan and 20 to you. What happened? You won. Because at the end, you were the one who scored. When the final whistle was blown, there we are. With us, when the final trumpet is blown, that is how we will be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how you've led your life right now, there is a hadith that says there would be a person who may have led their lives in such a, an outwardly pious way, but at the end, they did such evil deeds and their lives ended in an evil way. They would lose. And what happens with a person who led their lives or people who lead their lives in such an evil way and at the end they seek forgiveness. They are remorseful. They ask Allah's forgiveness. Allah says mercy to them. The example of a person. There is a specific hadith. The example of a particular person. The hadith says 70 years of bad deeds and at the end they did a good deed and Allah granted them Jannah. So gems of the belief in the hereafter, you never know which one of the deeds that you've done with sincerity for the sake of Allah has been loved by Allah to the degree that he grants you paradise, ignoring all the other deeds. That's what it is. Take a look at the hadith of a man who quenched the thirst of a dog, a woman who quenched, for example, the thirst of a cat and so on. There are so many examples and these examples go to show that even though some of these people were really evil in terms of the amount of sin they committed, they had sincerity and they turned to Allah through a deed of compassion. They felt in their hearts, let me reach out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the deed and he says, I looked at this deed and I forgave a person. Now we have one problem. What is the problem? From amongst us, there are those whom shaitan comes to again and says, look, don't worry. Never mind your dress code. Never mind what you do. You can go to the clubs. You can party. You can alcohol. You can adultery. Everything. Just keep a whole load of cats and start feeding them every day. <laughs> yes, that's a misunderstanding. That is absolutely wrong. It is your duty to be the best Muslim possible, the best human being possible. You have one chance. Wouldn't you like to win the match? Today we look at World Cup and we are excited because our team won. We know nobody from the team, but we are more excited than they are. We get so upset, we start crying real tears when they've lost. What about the real match? Let that not distract you from real life matters. The real life, there is, it's not a game actually, but... It works somehow similarly in certain aspects of it. The fact that it has a beginning and an end and the fact that whoever scores the most wins. This is something regarding the hereafter. You are alive, my sisters. You are alive. You are breathing. Do you know what? For as long as you're alive, you still have a lot of hope in the mercy of Allah. And don't think that if something has happened, not according to your liking, that Allah dislikes you, hates you. No, he has packaged you a test, as we said in the earlier lecture. He has packaged for you a certain package. He will test you with those tests. They have to come in your direction. You will not be able to chase them away. You have to take them in your stride and you have to do the best given the situation you're in. You have to, you have no option. You know, a day may come when you might be present in a place where something really disastrous happens, whether it is a tsunami, whether it is an earthquake, whether it is some form of disaster created by man or otherwise, and you need to know how to deal with it. You cannot become despondent. You have to have hope in the mercy of Allah so much so that my mothers and sisters, I can tell you, as we grow older, we become weaker. You know that? The peak of age is 40 years. 
فلما بلغ أشده وبلغ أربعين سنة. The Quran speaks of al-ashud in more than one place, which means the peak. And Allah says that is forty years. When man gets to the peak of forty years, which means after forty, at forty you've arrived at the top of the summit, the top of the mount, and now you're sliding down slowly, slowly. You cannot deny that. You know, we feel good when we are sixty, seventy, and someone says you're looking young. Oh, thank you. Hear that? <laughs> it's an honor to be told you're now looking old. Subhanallah. Because why? It's a gem of the belief in the hereafter. You are reminded you're going to Allah. When you are told that you are becoming old and you are returning to Allah, do you become depressed? If that's the case, you still need to purify your belief. Don't be depressed. Death is not something evil. It has to happen to every one of us. If death was evil, Allah would not have written it for anyone. But it is written for absolutely all of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All. It's just going from stage one to stage two. You want to graduate from primary school to the university or from secondary school to the university, but you want to still remain in the same classroom. You've got to walk out. That's when you're going to get your graduation, subhanAllah. That's when you're going to be able to go now to the next stage. Walk out. No, I can't walk out. Very bad. That's, what, that's how we look at life as. I don't want to walk out of this life. Allah says, you don't take your own life away. No, suicide is prohibited. We all know that. It's a major sin. A person who commits suicide will not be seeing the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless they were unwell mentally and they didn't know what they were doing. That's between them and Allah. And for this reason, we never judge people who may have committed suicide due to depression because you don't know upon what condition they've died. But at the same time, we will continue speaking about how prohibited it is because life is sacred and it is the ownership of Allah. Not mine and not yours. Remember this, life is so sacred, it's not owned by you, it is owned by Allah. You're not allowed to take it away. You cannot, not even your own life, because your own life is owned by Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember this. And this is where Islam says that it is prohibited to harm yourself. You know, those who are trying to give up smoking, may Allah make it easy for you. It's sad that I have to say this in front of all the mothers and sisters, but sadly I've seen mothers and sisters puffing away like chimneys. My beloved mothers and sisters, it's a bad habit. Give it up. It harms you, doesn't it? If you take a look at some of the packagings of cigarettes that show you, you know, photographs of lungs and little, uh, you know, body parts, it is a disgrace to believe that I'm a mu'min, I believe in Allah, I want to get to the hereafter, and here I am actually trying to harm the same body that is actually not even mine. Allah gave you this body as a uniform, just to be known in this world. Otherwise, it's going to go. That's it. You're going to be separated from the body. You will carry on and the body will probably be buried and it may be decomposed in no time. So we need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept something unique for us. You have hope. You've sought forgiveness. Allah has forgiven you. Believe in your heart. Allah has forgiven me. When you become older and as you become sickly, it has to happen. You cannot remain healthy forever. Things change. They have to change. So if you don't believe properly in the hereafter, you become depressed. You become a person who wants to cling to life at any cost. Any cost. You become a person who wants to defy your age. Don't worry. If people say, Mashallah, this person is aging now. So what? Alhamdulillah. You know, you might not want to say it in a disastrous way. I'm not promoting that you say it to one another. Are you looking old, sister? <laughs> I'm not promoting that you say that to one another. Don't hurt one another. But I am trying to say, become conscious of the fact that you're no longer as you were before when you were younger. you no longer. So what you do? Prepare for the meeting with Allah. And how do you prepare for the meeting with Allah? Well, the Quran tells you very clearly, you're looking forward to meeting with Allah. Guess what? Allah is looking forward to meeting with you. Amazing. Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa'ah. Whoever... Loves to meet with Allah. Allah loves to meet with them. Remember this. Surah Al Kahf. A lot of us read it. We say, Oh, Kahfi, mashallah, we read it in Jum'ah. Do you know what it means? Have you read the last verse of Surah Al-Kahf? Allah tells you whoever wants, whoever is looking forward to meeting with Allah. 
Whoever is looking forward to meeting with their Rabb, the one who made them, who is looking forward to meeting with him, guess what? Allah says he should make sure that he is doing two things. Then the meeting will be fruitful. Number one, do good deeds that are acceptable. Al-amal. Amal means a deed, referring to acts of worship. And salih means acceptable, pure, good. What is an acceptable deed? An acceptable deed unanimously, according to the scholars of tafsir and hadith and jurisprudence, an acceptable deed or an acceptable act of worship is that act of worship that was taught, instructed, or practiced upon by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's it. So if someone asks you, what is a good deed? A good deed is a deed that was taught, practiced, or promoted, instructed by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That is a good deed in terms of acts of worship. If you have engaged in an act of worship sincerely for the sake of Allah, Allah alone, and it has made you cry, and you've become moved by it, but it was not instructed or taught or brought about by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he has not condoned it in any way, trust me, you've wasted your time preparing for the meeting with Allah. It's going to be a terrible meeting. May Allah not do that to us. So it's not good enough for us to do deeds that are nowhere to be found in the instruction of the one whom Allah loves so much that he chose him as the best of creation, the most noble of prophets, and to come to us to teach us and instruct us. And we ignore that completely. I've ignored it. I know better than Muhammad. Who was he? I know better than him. I will do an act of worship he didn't do because it makes me cry. It makes me weep. Wallahi, if you go to the non-Muslims, they will also make you weep. They will make you cry. Shaitan can also make you cry. Do you know that? That's not a sign that what you're doing is right. I was moved by it. Being moved by it is not a sign that it was right. You need to know, was it instructed by the most beloved, the one whom I'd like to enter paradise with. If that's the case, don't increase, don't decrease, nothing. Be as best as you can, remain there. This is something simple, logical. And I always tell people, if you know the Quran, you know the meaning of the Quran, nobody can fool you. The problem is when you don't know the meaning of the Quran, or you've just heard it and you haven't confirmed it, you may be fooled. People might con you. They might tell you, you know, to get to Allah, you need to go through mediums. And you go through one medium, another medium, another medium. Trust me, the medium itself has no guarantee that it will be in Jannah. Remember this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I might be standing in front of you. What right do I have to tell you to worship me, to honor me, to do this to me? Who am I? A nobody. That's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Then the verse continues and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and let them never associate partners with me in worship. Never. So whoever is looking forward to meeting with Allah, you want to go into the hereafter, you want to have a beautiful hereafter, you want to be the queen of queens in the hereafter. Yes, there is a simple method. Surah Al-Kahf, go and read the last verse. What does Allah say? You are look whoever is looking forward to the meeting with their Rabb. Let them do deeds that were done or taught or condoned, instructed by or that which was brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's number one. Number two is let them never ever associate partners with me in worship. No way. You worship your Maker alone, and this is something unique when it comes to the Muslims. The whole religion is based on the oneness of Allah. That's what makes us monotheistic. That's what makes us different. Why were the polytheists fought at the time of Mecca? If they were correct, there would have been no, for, no fighting. There would have been no war, nothing at all. But they were wrong. And not only wrong, they usurped the wealth. They did not live and let live. That is why when they, when they drove the Muslimin out of Mecca and they usurped their wealth, the Muslimin came back in order to get it back. This is mine. This was mine. When we were weak and downtrodden, you took it. Now we are prepared to come and reclaim what was legitimately ours. So we believe that we will never render an act of worship for a stick or a stone or a saint or a grave or a tree or an animal or any of the other creatures of Allah. The one who made you is the only one who is fit to be worshipped. That's it. When we say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, what does it mean? There is no one worthy of worship. 
If you say there is no God but Allah, someone might say you're telling a lie. There are so many gods. So we need to say there is no true God besides Allah. There may be a thousand gods, a million gods, but there is no true God besides Allah. So you don't just translate it literally and say there is no God but Allah. The proper translation comes with a slight bit of an explanation through a word worthy of worship. There is none worthy of worship besides Allah. No deity, nothing worthy of worship besides He who made me. Whoever made me, He's the one that I worship. That's it, no one else. This is why, and I'm sure you have seen people, you may have seen people declare their shahada as they are entering the fold of Islam, reverting to Islam. What do they say? Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu or wa anna Muhammadan rasulullah. You can say it either way. One is more simple for those who may not be speaking the Arabic language. So I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. This goes back to the core. It shows you that in Islam, the main thing, even to enter the fold of Islam, you need to say, I'm never going to worship anyone or anything but Allah. But we still find ourselves worshiping this one and that one and this saint and that dead man and this grave and this, for example, tree and this. Why? For what? It negates your faith because you are lying that you believe that there is none worthy of worship but Allah because you're worshiping things besides Allah. It's simple as that. Common logic. Don't let shaitan make your belief in the hereafter become shaky. Because then what will happen is when you get there, you might find yourself on the wrong side. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. My mothers and sisters, this is actually a serious topic. It is actually a very serious topic because those who don't believe in the hereafter, for example, there are people who don't believe in the hereafter. There are perhaps those who don't even believe there is a God they become really depressed towards the end of their lives because they actually don't have a clue where they're going. They don't have a clue. At least we're looking forward to something. And we know that, look, today, we're so sophisticated. Do you really think that we were just naturally here? So sophisticated. The clothing you have, the watches you have, everything you have, the perfume you have, the design, you know, the shape you have. Everything, your eyes, your nose, how it works, the, the environment, the motor vehicles you use, and the way Allah's given us the ability, the mind, the brain. When I was flying into this country, I'm looking at the clouds and thinking, subhanAllah, look at the creation of Allah. It's raining here, it's not raining here. Look at how a shadow is created here, this part of the earth. Look at how there are seasons. Look at everything. Look around you. Everything will lead you to the fact that there is a maker. And all Allah is saying is, look, we want you to worship that very maker alone. And you tell yourself, I'm so sophisticated. I have, for example, children, family members, perhaps a bit of wealth, things that are dear to me. Do you really think that suddenly, boom, and everything is gone, gone forever? You're never going to see them, they're never going to see you, and it's all over and gone. Do you really think that? The reality is our lives are too complex and complicated to have just been. Now you're there, now you're not. You have to be going somewhere where the others whom I've really loved and whom I've really been with, and whom I really care for, will be there as well. That's what it is. I believe that firmly. Those whom I've loved, they could not have just disappeared into thin air. Gems of the belief in the hereafter would dictate that definitely I'm going to see them. Those are one of the gems. Otherwise, we would die depressed. Imagine you lose a loved one and you're told, it's over, it's gone. Never going to see them, they're never going to see you. It's cut and that's it. Forget about them. They were just like a little animal that was just, you know, dead and gone. How? We believe we are mu'mineen. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to us in an amazing way. He says, we brought you into life from non-existence. Where were you, say, if I am 40 years old, for example? Where was I 41 years ago, 42 years ago? I was not even to be mentioned. I was nothing. I was not even in existence yet. Not at all. Not in the form of a semen, not, nor in the form of an egg. Nothing. Allah knows. And then what happened is I came into creation by the qudra of Allah. Imagine when you are born or when you, when you are still a little zygote in the belly of your mom. Do you know what? The multiplication of those cells is so quick, so rapid, so unique and so perfect. That your eyes fall in place, everything else falls in. Do you really think that one day we're just going to suddenly chop off? That's it, gone. 
Those who don't believe in the hereafter, they suffer very deeply later on in their lives when they start losing their energies, when they struggle and suffer. When they struggle and suffer, they really have a problem. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen us. My mothers and sisters, there are issues that we need to deal with within our own belief. We need to bear in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us, bestowed upon us in a billion and one ways, the gifts that we take for granted. We take a lot of gifts for granted, subhanallah. One of them is the fact that we push through so many of the difficulties of life, having hope that the life after death is going to be easier. Subhanallah. Imagine when I am sick and ill, what do I do? I turn to Allah and I say, Oh Allah, help me, grant me shifa, grant me cure. Ya Allah, let this be an expiation for sins I may have committed. Let this be an elevation of status in the hereafter. And Allah says, yes, it will be an elevation of status for you in the hereafter. I believe there will be a perfect life that is going to come. I am too sophisticated as a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to believe that there is imperfection even in the hereafter. Enough of imperfection in this world. Subhanallah. The hereafter, absolutely perfect. The imperfections here, they are such that they lead me to the hope that I need in order to get to the hereafter, looking forward to that perfection. And this is why ask those who don't have a faith. Ask those who don't have a religion, who don't believe in the hereafter. Is your life perfect? They will tell you no, not at all. Not a single person can tell you their life is perfect. No one. Even those who just run behind the dunya whole day and whole night. Those who are running behind the world entire life. They will tell you it's not perfect. I have problems at work. I have problems with my health. I have problems in my love life. I have problems in this and problems in that. So many issues going on. Well, what is it you're looking forward for? Or to? What are you looking forward to? They'll tell you, well, I don't know. Some of them will take their lives away thinking that that's it, it's over. Subhanallah. They will tell you that's it, it's over. Imagine, you came into the world, you followed the whims and fancies of the world, you did not believe in a creator, a maker, you did not worship Allah, you didn't believe in the hereafter, still you suffered in this world. How come? How come? We will go through similar to what you went through, but the difference is we have hope that in the future, there is a hereafter, we have belief that we will be in a better place. That's what it is. That belief keeps us going. And it keeps us disciplined. If a person does not believe, they are let loose. They do what they want. They commit sins as they wish. They start thinking in a way that subhanallah, they want to start marrying the sheep and the goats. And for them, wow, that's it. Because they have no belief. They are not governed by anything besides whims and fancies. They are busy thinking up new things to do. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if people begin to Astaghfirullah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all purity and goodness and cleanliness. But people begin to legitimize marriage to animals. And it may happen in the next 10 years. And guess what? It might be illegal in some countries to condemn it after 50 years from today. Because that's how the world is moving. Things have already happened that were considered absolutely unacceptable 50 years ago. To talk about them today, you may be locked up in some countries. Where is your belief in the hereafter? We believe that we were brought into this world for a purpose. We believe that that purpose is made clear in the Quran. It's common logic. I will worship whoever made me alone. And that's it. Subhanallah. This is what makes you a believing female. This is what makes you a believing male. When you say to yourself, I came into this world. I could not have just come in for, for fun, for nothing. I, I have such a life. Look, we have feelings for one another, for our children, for our spouses. We have, we care. We, you know, we, we can feel if, if, if we touch something that perhaps that is sharp, we are hurt. If we put our hands, for example, on a candle, we will be burnt. And you're trying to tell me that there is no hereafter. You're trying to tell me that we suddenly come to an end decomposed in the soil. Some people say you become a bird or a snake or a donkey or a monkey, depending on how you led your life. We believe no. 
We will not be degraded, rather we will graduate into something greater. Allah does not make you and then degrade you into something you know, lower than what you were. This is the highest of all creation, is mankind. Ashraful khalq, ashraful makhluqat. The most honored, the most noble of all the creatures of Allah, Allah made man. Subhanallah. So we believe in the hereafter. All this stemmed from the hadith of Jibreel, where we spoke of Iman and we spoke of Ihsan. And I told you, I would tell you the difference between Islam and Iman. Let me explain to you. A lot of us, what would happen is we would say, I'm a Muslim. You know what? That's quite accurate. Sometimes it may not be because we're not Muslim. Muslim comes from the, the, the root words, you know, a few, a root word made up of three letters, the seen, the lamb and the meme. And what we would find with these three letters in the Arabic language, they are expanded and extended to refer to two main points. One is peace. So people say Islam means peace. Correct. And the other is submission. It's Islam. I've submitted. The idea here is when you submit, you achieve peace. You don't submit, you don't achieve peace. I have spoken to so many people who have been so depressed because of themselves turning away from Allah. Depression. I have had people, and I'm sure you've seen it, and some of you might have experienced it yourself. Those who discard their prayer, those who discard them, those who lose themselves in the nightlife and the glimmer and the glitter, or the glamour and the glitter of the dirty life. They're into pornography, they're into drugs, they become locked up in a dark pit and a dark corner at a certain stage they become fed up with their lives so fed up why it's allah's gift that you are fed up because allah is trying to tell you hang on there is something much more noble and i want to teach you something you know to smile is a sunnah i'm sure we all know that right do you know if you go to work as a muslim and you always have a good expression on your face you're always smiling guess what will happen there are so many people around you today that are not Muslim, that don't have belief. They are searching for one thing. Everyone is searching for one thing, contentment, happiness. Everyone is looking for happiness, no matter how much wealth they have. Something wrong in the home, something wrong here. That's a gift of Allah, searching for happiness. And they see you every time you're smiling. That's sunnah. So I'm smiling, my expression. And you know these people working with me, but look at her. She's just smiling. We have this problem, that problem. What's going on? She's just smiling. Automatically, it makes them feel good, number one. Number two, it makes them want to know what is it that makes you keep smiling. You have bigger problems than mine, but I see you no problem, sister. It's okay. It's one of those things. And I've got a small little problem. One peanut was stuck in my throat and I almost died. You know? Subhanallah. It's the expression on your face. That's why it's a sunnah. It's not just a smile is not just a sunnah for nothing. You can talk about it for two days. It's a smile, it's something genuine. It, it really gives, the, it creates an ambience that is indescribable. It, may, it gives a feeling of goodness. It makes people forget about their problems. In fact, it makes them feel that this is not even a problem worth being depressed about. Not even. And at the same time, subhanAllah, it solves your own matters. You're happy, you have hope in Allah. Alhamdulillah, things could have been worse. I'm looking at people who've lost all their children. I've just lost two. Subhanallah. May Allah grant you Jannah. May Allah grant them Jannah. Your sabr, your patience will definitely be a gem for the hereafter. Your sabr, your patience will definitely be a gem for the hereafter. Remember this. So you smile and that is something you beam. It is just a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So important. Many of us are not even bothered. We look so depressed that even the happy people become depressed when they see us. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Everyone's happy and they see you and they're like, what happened here? Because, oh, that's it. May Allah never make us from among those who beam negative energy. May we be from among those who beam positive energy all the time. No matter what. It's, it's an ibadah. Not only for yourself, you've reached out to others through a beautiful smile. And it doesn't always have to be such a broad smile that people think that, you know what, this is not legit. People can pick up that it's legitimate. It's just an expression on your face. Even if it just, you just break into it. Subhanallah. 
So getting back to the issue of Islam, it is to submit to Allah. When I say I'm a Muslim, it means I've submitted to Allah. Muslim, Islam refers to five pillars. Generally, when we use the term Islam on its own, it includes Iman in it. It includes the belief in it. But when we use the two terms together and we want to know the difference, then let's listen to it. Islam is five pillars. Take a look at them to utter the Shahada. So people can see I've uttered it. I've said it, right? Physically, I've surrendered to it. I've said the words. People have witnessed it and so on. So I'm considered a person who surrendered. I said things. I fulfill my salah. People can see that this person's fulfilling their salah. It's an action. It is something physical. You can actually see it. I abstain from food. People can see this person's not eating. I gave them. They only eating. For example, at this time, it is something physical. They can see Islam. You can actually see they are deeds that can be noticed and seen. That's what it is. The zakah you've given, people have seen, for example, or they can see, they could see. You, we are taught, obviously, to try our best not to make a public issue out of it unless there is some benefit from publicizing. We shouldn't be publicizing. But at the same time, people know, they can see, it's physical. You go for hajj, everybody knows. You've gone for hajj, mashallah. And so on. That is Islam. You have surrendered and submitted. But do you believe in your heart? No one knows besides you and Allah. That's where the issue of don't judge me comes in. Don't judge me. I know it's Allah. But the problem is today we're saying don't judge me because we don't want to be told my sister, the way you've covered yourself is actually not ideal. The problem with us, and we have a problem on both sides here, both sides of the coin. One is the way people correct others becomes very, very embarrassing and sometimes so derogatory and cutting that we forget we all need correction. And on the other hand, the way we react to correction is such that we just don't want to be corrected sometimes. So we have a problem both sides. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, uh, you shouldn't be judging, but I'm, I'm supposed to be correcting. All I did is in a nice way, I said, oh, my sister, you know, I have a thousand and one weaknesses. Please, can you highlight them for me? I'd like to improve. And you know what? I don't mean to be bad. There's just the two of us. I'm not saying it in public, but I'd like you to consider X, Y, and Z, and you tell her what you want. Subhanallah. You've said it in a beautiful way, not in an arrogant way. Not in a holier than thou way. This is where people actually turn away from the faith. Because we preach the faith in a way that we are holier than them. I'm holier than you. Subhanallah. I feel like I'm really a big person. You are going to hell. Have you heard that? If you haven't, you're lucky. Mashallah. You're fortunate. Because there are people who make you, who give you that vibe, the feeling you're going to hell. Who said you're going to hell? For now, we're alive. Who knows the person being spoken to might become better than the person speaking. It's possible. And who knows they might already be better. But that does not mean that we should not be advising one another. Similarly, when it comes to the issue of, when it comes to the issue of surrendering to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to know that Islam, that the word Islam is used for that which is physical, that which you can see. The word Iman is used for that which you cannot see. So, Amantu, I believe. I believe in what? I believe in Allah. Okay, you said you believe in Allah. Whether you actually believe in Allah or not, no one knows besides you and Allah. Many of us claim to be believers in Allah alone, and yet we do things sometimes that are not really that. Do you agree? So we need to purify. Because if you would like a beautiful hereafter, purify yourself. Cleanse yourself. Worship Allah in a beautiful way, in a way that He wants. Worship Him alone. And at the same time, we say, Wa malaikati, I believe in the angels. Whether you do believe in the angels or not, Allah knows, you know. It, it, it's in the heart, isn't it? So if someone were to come to you and say, you don't believe in Allah, you have the right to say, don't judge me. Because that nobody can see besides you and Allah. If someone says, you don't believe in the angels, you have the right to say, don't judge me. I do. If someone says, don't, you don't believe, for example, in the previous prophets or the prophets, you have the right to say, don't judge me. Because it's in the heart. There is no way of manifesting it besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing. That's it. Meaning it's only in the knowledge of Allah. So we believe that is iman. iman. This is why in the Quran, there is a verse towards the end of Surah Al-Hujurat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the, some of the Bedouin Arabs. Some of the Bedouin Arabs said, we are believers. We are believers. 
So Muhammad وسلم, was instructed to remind them that you are not yet believers. So far, you are just submitters. But belief has not yet infiltrated the heart. Say that you are, you have not yet believed, but you have submitted. Aslamna, we you have submitted, but Iman is not yet engraved in your heart. You need to know and you need to believe. So Iman is a struggle all the way. Subhanallah. To preserve it so that it's not lost. I'm a mu'min or I'm not a mu'min. Allah creates people from among them, there are mu'mineen and there are those who are not mu'mineen. One of two. Those who are mu'mineen, the quality of that iman would obviously differ in the sense that you feel very pious sometimes, don't you? You feel very pious sometimes, you feel closer, you hear a powerful talk, you want to change, change quickly. Because you will not remain on that level for long. The minute you come out, you are bombarded by so many other things in the environment. You may not remain on that level. So if you would like to change your life, you would like to do something, do it now. Don't wait for tomorrow. When you walk out, you're going to meet those same friends of yours who used to take you to the clubs and they'll say, come on, man, let's enjoy. You know, in reality, outwardly, they are enjoying inside. They are dying spiritually dead and if they don't feel that they are spiritually dead right now they will feel it a little bit later on once something is depleted from either their health or their wealth or something else with us as it depletes we look forward to the meeting with allah and i've spoken to many people who happen to be sickly and ill sometimes terminally ill sometimes on what you and i would term the deathbed the reason why we cannot confirm it's a deathbed is because Allah alone knows whether he's going to grant them cure or take them away. But we can say the final you know, illness that they finally passed away with. And I would always say to such people, die with a smile, have hope in the mercy of Allah. Remember, keep on asking Allah's forgiveness and keep on repeating your shahada and have hope that you are going to a better place because you see the reason why I would say this to them is People will die depressed or they will die hopeful. If you're a believer, you will never die depressed. You are suffering. There is pain here. There is cancer in the body. May Allah grant cure to all those who may have any sickness. I mean, you have cancer. A person has AIDS, for example. Someone else has something else, for example. And they happen to be patient. They happen to have returned to Allah. That pain they are going through, Allah's mercy dictates that they will not go through pain beyond a certain threshold. They will be unconscious after that. If you fell from the second floor of a building, for example, and you broke 10 bones, you would be unconscious within a split second. Allah doesn't want you to taste pain beyond a certain threshold. That's His mercy. So if, the, if it's beyond a certain point, you don't. This is why people faint. This is why people go become unconscious. You know, you've lost a lot of blood. What do happens? You actually just go down and you fainted. You pass out. Why? It's the mercy of Allah. Imagine if Allah wanted you to taste all of that pain. There is only a certain amount you can take. Allah knows that. He won't allow you to go beyond. And there comes a threshold where He just takes your life away. Gone. He knew it was going to happen. He took it away. So don't worry. It's not going to be that bad that people make it out to be. Oh, death. You know, when you die, okay, relax. Don't talk to me in that way. I am going to die. I am going to die. And I believe in the hereafter. One of the best gems is for us to know that we will die with hope. We are hopeful. You, you smile. You say, oh Allah, I know I'm going to a better place. I know I'm going to your mercy. Oh Allah, I know I did a lot of bad things in my life. But oh Allah, I know you will forgive me. I've asked your forgiveness. You know, I had a person many years back when the AIDS disease was claiming so many people in Zimbabwe. What happened is some people came to me and said, you know, this is a punishment of Allah. And at the same time, these people are going to Jahannam. I said, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. They have a better chance to enter Jannah than you and I because they are, they, their hearts would have been softened. They ask Allah's forgiveness knowing that, you know what, I'm going. You and I don't even know that you're going and you might go before them. So don't come to me and tell me that because a person has AIDS or because they have a disease for whatever reason that they will go to hell. Who are you? Do you own hell or are you the CEO of hell? May Allah forgive us. 
You cannot say that to anyone. Never ever. You can never tell someone because you know you suffered so Allah hates you. Never. Perhaps it's Allah's love and Allah tells you I will make you go through difficulty in this world so that you do not go through it in the hereafter. There you are. You struggled, you suffered once. Wait, come here. We've got something in store for you. When you see it, you will be so, so happy. Let me give you one of the gems of belief in the hereafter. The hadith makes mention of how a sick person will be getting reward such that when they see it in the hereafter, they will say, Oh Allah, why didn't you keep me sick for longer? Because hey, I, I, you know, it happened. And when I was sitting talking to some young people, I gave them one example and I want to give it to you because it's obviously something worth thinking about. If someone told you that I'm going to give you a cough, but for every time you coughed and the phlegm came out with blood, I give you 20,000 US dollars. What would happen? I think there would be a line of youngsters all wanting to cough blood. Do you agree with me? Sorry to give you this example, but I'm only trying to bring something closer to the mind. Some people wouldn't mind going through a sickness. There are people today in some of the poorer countries of the globe who don't mind going through giving birth for someone else. Islamically, it's haram. Remember this. They don't mind the, you know, the child of someone else being put into their belly for nine months, giving birth to a person who's not connected to them besides through the gestation period. And they are doing it in order to be paid for it. Imagine. Near death, so many may have lost their lives in that childbirth, but they don't mind because they're making, for example, 5,000 US dollars out of it. Wow. I told you, Islamically, it's haram. It's not allowed. It's prohibited. It's a no-go area because lineage and marriage and childbirth and all this is sacred. It belongs to Allah alone. He chooses whether he wants to give it to you or not. And as we said in the earlier lecture, if you do not have children, may Allah bless you with them. You may pursue whatever means you would like to pursue on condition that they are permissible, such as the medical avenue and so on. Remember this. But at the same time, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept you ill and sick, never mind 20,000 US dollars, you will be getting something in return with one condition. And that is your sabr together with the iman you have. Your patience. What did I say moments ago? Patience is one of the biggest gems that you would have to come to your rescue when it's your hereafter. When you arrive in the hereafter, you will have these huge points of assistance and help. What will they be? They will be your patience. I was very patient. I went through a lot. I went through torment. I went through disease. I went through marital crises, disrespect, problems with in-laws, problems with outlaws, whatever it was. Sabr, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Whenever I speak of in-laws, I hear whispers. I hope, I hope we are not the bad ones. Make life easy for others. Allah makes life easy for you. And make life easy for others. Allah will make your life easy and your hereafter. Listen. Man nafasa an muslimin kurbatan min kurabi dunya nafasa Allahu anhu kurbatan min kurabi yawmil qiyamah. Whoever alleviates the suffering of a human being in this world, Allah will alleviate their suffering on the here on, on the great day. Subhanallah, the day of judgment. Subhanallah. And another narration says, whoever makes things easy for people, Allah will make things easy for them in the world and in the next. And another narration says, whoever covers the faults of believers, Allah will cover their faults in the hereafter. Look at these gems. You cover the faults today. Very sadly, we have technology and we have the social media that a lot of us are using in order to spread gossip and rumor and whatnot about people. By doing that, we're losing. Our gems are collecting dust. No one will know it's a diamond. It looks like a stone. Why? Because you've just been spreading rumor about everyone. You use your WhatsApp and your BBM and your Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WeChat and Line and whatever else. To do what? You know, that sister, this person, oh, the child they had, this child is illegitimate, that person's doing this, that person's that, this person's marriage is about to break, that one is, uh, you know, doomed to hell, the other person was seen drinking. What's all that got to do with you spreading it? For what? If you want, as a believer, you need to help the situation or shut up. Sorry to say that. But that's exactly what it is. You need to keep quiet. You might say, why did you say that? I did for a reason. Because sometimes that's exactly what you need. Keep quiet. Subhanallah, keep quiet. 
if you're a believing male or female and you would like to have a good hereafter, when you see someone doing bad, ask yourself, how best can I help? That's the word. Not how best can I destroy their lives? No. We destroy people's lives, good people, because the movies teach us to do that. Because environment teaches us to do that. You break each other's lives. You know, little girls fighting like cats. Why? But it's happening, and it's happening on a global level. And it's on the rise. It's growing, because people don't believe in the hereafter. You see your sister, make life easy for her. You see her excelling, congratulate her, be happy for her. We become jealous. What is this all about? You're losing your hereafter. You're you losing your hereafter. So let's try our best, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to improve ourselves. My mothers and sisters, what is important for us to know is that we call ourselves Muslim, but are we definitely Muslim? Meaning we say we've surrendered. Have you surrendered? It's a question. You might say, not yet. Okay, well, try your best. Secondly, what you need to know is, we call ourselves mu'min. We say we are believers. Do you really believe? Do you really believe that good and bad fate is from Allah? And we've discussed this in the past, speaking about fate and destiny and predestiny. Allah says in the Quran that He has kept predestiny in order that you don't become so excited regarding what you've got and you don't become depressed regarding what has been taken away from you. So that you do not become so saddened with what Allah took away. It's good to say this was just predestined. And so that you do not become too happy with what Allah has given you in the sense that it draws you or drives you to arrogance and pomp and pride. Allah says, hang on, you're just a man. You're just a human being. You're just a woman. You're just a creature of ours. We've bestowed upon you. We can take it away from you. If you have wealth today, position today, beauty today, goodness today, do not think it's going to last forever. There will come a day if Allah wants, He can take it away from you in several ways. With disgrace or with grace, which means with goodness, with respect. Or He can leave you in that position or with that gift of His. It's all Allah's plan. He says, it's our decision. We will do. You believe correctly, it will help you through your life and take you into the hereafter. I want to end off by saying something very important. And that is, my mothers and sisters in life, we never get everything we want. But we get so many things that we take for granted. Remember, those things that happen not according to your liking, if you were to bear patience, if you were to try your best with whatever capacity you've been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at the same time, you were to bear patience regarding what Allah has put in your lives by the will of Allah, you will be going to a very good place. Learn to improve yourselves. Learn to improve whatever you, you know, whatever you learn, try and put it into practice. We improve ourselves. We humble ourselves. We become people closer to Allah. We reach out to human beings. We reach out to Muslims. We reach out to non-Muslims. We reach out to the creatures of Allah. I always say, if a person was given heaven because of quenching the thirst of a dog or a cat, what about quenching the thirst of a human being who's not a Muslim? I think they are far more noble and far greater than a cat and a dog in terms of deservance of service. Remember what I've said. What I mean is deservance of service. If I see a dog drowning and next to them a human being drowning by right, who should I say first? Subhanallah. I remember I entered a shop. I entered, I was at an airport in Johannesburg many years ago and I entered a, one of the stores and I bought something. I can't recall what it was. And there was a lady sitting at the back and she was at the till. When I purchased the stuff, I went to the till and I paid. And there were a few coins. Now, you know, coins are difficult to carry sometimes, especially when you're crossing through the, the security checkpoint and so on. They beep and what have I have a habit. A few coins, donate them to a good cause. So, you know, like they say, your change can make a change. So, mashallah, it does. <laughs> so, alhamdulillah. What happened is I, I looked at her and I had these coins quite a bit, but there were these coins. And I told her, uh, do you have a little tin I can put it in, perhaps SPCA or something? You know, SPCA stands for Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, okay? I got it right, yeah. 
So, so basically, SPCA, so there was a little like a doggy there with a small box in front saying SPCA, you know, a small little, like a little thing there. Stand. And I just saw it as I was asking her the question. And I was about to put the money in and she says, you know what she said? She says, ruff, ruff, I'm the only doggy around. <laughs> Which means, please give me the money. I need it more than putting it in. And I said, no, you're a human being. I gave her, because obviously she might have needed the money for whatever reason. But I, I gave her, but I said, please don't call yourself a doggy, you know. <laughs> so she says, no, I was just trying to say, you know, she made it clear that I was just trying to say, instead of putting it into there, give it to me. I said, well, if I knew we were allowed to give tips, some people are offended when you give them change. So I don't know. It's good you made it clear. The point I'm raising is, look, it's nature, it's natural to feel that this guy is, I need this and he's giving it to an animal. We are not saying we don't look after the animals, but there is a prioritization. That's all there is. There is prioritization. That's all there is. This is why when it comes to the issue of zakah, you cannot give it to an animal. But when it comes to an issue of voluntary charities, you may want to look after some of the needs or some of the preservation or whatever else to do with animals. But that also from a portion of that which is voluntary. Voluntary charity, not your zakah. Zakah, there are asnaf, there are certain people and certain parties that you have to give to. You cannot cross the boundary there. May Allah make it easy for us, I pray. And I have hope in the mercy of Allah. And I pray that Allah grant us all jannah, a better hereafter. And I really ask you, if you feel in your heart you would like to change your life for the better, if there is a sin you are committing that you want to drop, if there is a good deed that you would like to add or do in your life from the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, make the resolution here and now before you get up from your seat. Have your life changed. Do not say, I'm going to go out and change. You may never get a chance again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He strengthen us. May He grant us every form of goodness. May He grant us paradise. And may He make the hereafter better than this particular life. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Ah.